phospholipids that are derived from that of triacylglycerol. Phospholipids are a different world altogether. They will require an important component called as phosphate in them. And that phosphate is capable of adding polarity to them because phosphate has a charge, PO4, 3 minus. So that will change the ball game completely when it comes to a difference between that of triacylglycerol and phospholipids. Okay. Now, how exactly are you trying to introduce a phosphate into the phospholipids? I have told you in short already. I'll just repeat this for the sake of completion here. When I have triacylglycerol, that is three carbons of a glycerol with two of them having fatty acids, while the third one is having a phosphate bound to it, this is called as phosphatidic acid, also referred to as diacylglycerol. So, when you are capable of adding that X factor, that extra additional factor to this, then that will be called as a extended phospholipid path. So, we go for phosphate. This phosphate has a property that it will give you the polar head, while the fatty acids are the ones who will give you the non-polar head. And when I drew the lipid bilayer for you, look at this, you will have the heads called as phosphates going in here, phosphates going in here, while the fatty acids bound to the glycerol are the ones who are capable of making a tail here. So it means fatty acids are forming the tail here. This would mean to say that the polar head can interact with water. It means there is a very good possibility they can interact with blood also. But these are hydrophobic pockets. Hydrophobic pockets. So if a compound which is actually water soluble comes here, it can solubilize. But the probability is that it won't be able to enter this area. So this area will be off limits for that particular compound who can deal with this. The second thing is that if a compound is hydrophobic, it can actually deal with this, but they won't be able to enter through it because of which you will not be able to enter any deeper, they get repelled in this area. So a phospholipid bilayer is a selective permeable membrane. It decides what to send inside and what not to send inside depending upon which situation the particular compound is coming up with. If the situation is that way that the compound is showing its hydrophilic exterior to the membrane, the polar heads will interact then the compound exhibits a hydrophobic property, then the central area of fatty acids will interact with them. Again, they will be expelled into the cell. So permeability can be very high for carbon dioxide and gases. The next in line will be for water, then will be in form of solutes. Okay. Now, what are the classifications for phospholipids? Classification of phospholipids. We have first one, foremost one called as glycerophospholipid. The other would be the opposite called as sphingophospholipid. What about the glycerophospholipids? There are glycerol moiety present in them as the alcohol. In case of single phospholipid, amino alcohol called as sphingosin is present in them. Okay. First, we focus on the glycerophospholipids. We have phosphatidyl choline called as lecithin to deal with. How do you approach the structure of the phosphatidyl choline? Again, I will draw phosphatidic acid. See, every time I draw phosphatidic acid, it is to be understood that I am drawing this particular structure. The structure which I am actually marking in yellow, this structure which contains two carbons bound to fatty acids and the third carbon of glycerol bound to the phosphate. This together is called as a phosphatidic acid and you are going to add that extra X factor to it and that will make it as a proper phospholipid. Look at this. 
if I have a phosphoretic acid in hand and to the phosphate part of the phospholipid, you will be binding choline to it. This is called as lecithin. You may ask yourself, what is choline? We discussed in the amino acid chapter that choline is a cutting substance that contains trimethyl group bound to a nitrogen. So, how do I explain it? You have CH2, CH2 with an N and that N has already one bond satisfied with the CH2 group here and other bond is satisfied with a methyl group, one more bond is satisfied with a methyl group but now if you add the third methyl group, it gets a charge of plus here. So, if this binds to this area, it is called as lecithin. So, lecithin is important for integrity of cell membranes. I will tell you something interesting. In case of gas gangrene due to Clostridium perfringens, there is an enzyme from Clostridium is called as lecithinase. If I say the muscle layers are present like this, to enter into the muscle to cause gangrene, they should first be able to penetrate the myofascia surrounding them. So, to eat the muscles using proteolytic enzymes, that is muscle is made up of proteins. So, to eat the muscles, your clostridium perfringens will be having proteolytic enzymes. But they will not be able to act here if they can't penetrate through this area. So, perfringens will deliver the enzyme called as lecithinase that will break the lecithin so that the proteolytic enzymes can dig deeper. Then they can eat the muscles using anaerobic medium and then they can actually release something called as burst factor and this burst factor can cause proper cavities inside the particular muscle mass. This cavity will be filled by gas and the whole thing is called as gas gangrene. And what do you understand? Everything starts with one step and that step is release of lecithinase. Apart from that, what are the other functions of lecithin? Remember, dipamitoyl lecithin is the scientific name of lung surfactant. What is the meaning of the word surfactant? The one who can decrease surface tension. I will write it here. It decreases surface tension around the alveoli. Okay, I will make this as simple as possible. Please follow this. If I have a glass light placed in front of me and then I add a drop of water. If this water settles on the particular glass light, it will take up the shape of a hemisphere. If I zoom into this area, this is how this hemisphere will look and the reason is that the tension on the surface of the water droplet will act to the center. So, because all the tension is acting towards center, it is capable of maintaining a proper hemisphere. I haven't drawn a proper hemisphere here, but assume this is a proper hemisphere, then you'll understand that all the forces are towards the center. Now, what happens? If I place a oil droplet here, this oil droplet will not be able to enter into it. So, it gets scattered around this particular water droplet. That is why water, oil do not mix. The water surface tension is so high that it tries to come as close together as possible, making sure the smallest volume occupied by the water molecule here is hemisphere. But what do I do? I introduce a surface tension reducing agent. And what will this do? This will try to break this particular area. The force is acting on the center. So, automatically, this particular water droplet, who is supposed to be a hemisphere, will start flooding like this. Because of which, now water can enter into this area or oil can enter this area. Now, this is one of the reasons for understanding missile formation also. But, we will deal with that later. Here, what are the surface tension reducing agents you come across in life? Just now I spoke about surfactant present in the lung. Then you have detergents. That is the soaps we use for washing our clothes. Also bile salts. Bile salts act as surface tension reducing agents 
and the test for bile salts in the urine will be called as Hayes test. How do you perform this? You take a test tube and you fill it up with some amount of water. Then you take sulfur powder in terms of particles. They are extremely lightweight. If I throw the sulfur powder particles, I will be able to understand that these particles will come here and start floating on the surface. Why? Because they won't be able to enter into the depth of the water. Water keeps the particles afloat. But if I add a surface tension reducing agent like a surfactant or detergent or Or bile salts, the, sur the central tension area will be ruptured. Because it is ruptured, all the particles will go to the center so that at the end of the whole session, the water will not be able to keep it afloat. The sulfur particles will settle to the bottom as a small mass. This is called as positive haze test. And that is to tell you the surface tension in the water has been broken. Okay, we'll go one step forward. In case of surfactant in lung, how does it work? If I say this is alveolus and this is the adjacent alveolus, you will be having interstitial minimal amount of fluid. And this fluid is capable of impinging on the particular balloon-like alveoli because of which alveoli will not be able to expand any further. So what do you do? You will be producing the dipometoidal choline called as lecithin. That lecithin is surfactant which can break these kind of forces. When these forces are broken, then alveoli can expand and contract freely. That is inflation and deflation of alveoli can happen easily. And this is important for continuous breathing. Now what happens if this particular surfactant is reduced? This will cause respiratory distress syndrome. Decreased dipalmitoyl choline will cause respiratory distress syndrome. It will feel as if a huge amount of water has been settled inside your body. Even though you don't have much of water, you will feel like somebody sitting on your chest. You will actually find difficulty in breathing better. So all these are things that I want you to remember when it comes to dipalmitoyl choline. And sometimes students may be confused. These names are very difficult to remember. What is the meaning of dipalmitoyl choline? Nothing. In the glycerol moiety, when I said fatty acids are being bound, if those two fatty acids are palmitic acid, you call them as dipalmitoyl choline. Okay. Now, lecithin is also an important component of lipotropic factors present in your body. I told you, choline, betaine, etc. And lecithin is nothing but dipalmitoyl lecithin or dipalmitoyl choline is nothing but it contains more amount of choline. It is capable of offering you more amount of methyl groups that can be helpful for mobilization of fatty acids, prevention of fatty liver. <laughs> also, lecithin is an important component of phospholipids. How so? You will be knowing that many phospholipids have been a part of lipoproteins and these lipoproteins will actually carry lecithin. One such proof for that is you have an enzyme called as L-CAT. What is this L-CAT? Lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase. So what does this do? I'll just tell you this now so that when it comes to HDL metabolism and cycle, you don't have to worry much about understanding this particular enzyme. What does enzyme do? I told you, right? You have diacylglycerol phosphate. This will also contain choline, which is together called as lecithin. Now, when you bring cholesterol here, you are trying to transport cholesterol 
all other kinds of lipids through blood. And that is done by lipoproteins, I told you. So, cholesterol, if it has to be packed for it to be packed into lipoproteins, remember, you can pack cholesterol also. Sometimes will be also required to pack cholesterol esters. Ester means what? This cholesterol will require fatty acid. And who can offer fatty acid at will? Because you have diacylglycerol phosphate, a part of the choline, I mean, a part of the lecithin, it can offer acyl groups at will. It contains two acyl groups to release. So, you will have the enzyme called as L-CAT. That will cleave the acyl groups from the lecithin, which is a phospholipid, and send the acyl groups to the cholesterol, so that cholesterol will become cholesterol ester. And that ester can again become a part of your lipoproteins. So, lecithin, cholesterol, acyl...